Okay, uh, well, welcome everybody um, to another edition um, of PaleoPerks. Um, today, we're really excited um, to have Ariane Storari from the Federal University of Espírito Santo in Brazil. And Ariane's talk um, is going to be about taphonomy of aquatic insects from the crater formation Lagostata of Brazil under an actualistic look. Um, so quick um, format of today's seminar um, announcement. So we have welcome and announcements for around five minutes, uh, followed by Ariane's talk and a moderated Q&A. Um, so today we, we don't have tea time. Um, so remember to send in all of your questions via the chat to the questions at PaleoPerks host, who today is Natasha. Um, so a little bit of housekeeping. Um, so PaleoPerks values the participation of everybody interested in the paleo sciences. Um, please remember to abide by our code of conduct during today's seminar. If you somehow found yourself here um, without having signed this, please take a moment to go to our website um, and have a look at this and sign it. Please remember to mute yourself for the duration of the talk. Um, you shouldn't be able to unmute yourself, but if you find that you can, um, please remember that we'd like a quiet environment for our speakers, so don't. Um, you can also ask questions by chatting to the questions at PaleoPerks host or by using the raise hand function as well. So we'll um, unmute you for this and you can ask your question by voice. Um, any technical issues should also go to the question host. We have closed, closed captions built into Zoom and you can use the CC button at the bottom of your screen to show or hide them. Um, and also remember to nominate all of your outstanding early career friends um, with the website that will be dropped in the chat um, shortly. And remember to fill in our weekly feedback form for demographic information. Um, so we know a little bit more about who's attending today's seminar. Um, this is anonymous, optional, but very much encouraged, um, and you'll find it in the chat window very shortly. Um, so now um, it's my great pleasure to uh, welcome and announce today's speaker, um, Ariane Solari. So Ariane did her bachelor's and her master's um, at the Federal University of Espírito Santo in Brazil. So her bachelor's was in biological sciences and her master's was in animal biology. And she's also uh, currently a PhD student um, at the same institution. Um, so uh, I'm now going to hand over um, the floor to Ariane. Hello, I'm going to share my screen now. Okay, so thank you very much for the introduction. I'm pleased to be here and I hope you guys enjoy the talk I prepare in which I will present um, some preliminary results I'm gathering regarding a small part of my PhD. So in this talk entitled, Taphonomy of Aquatic Insects from the Quadrant Formation Large Set of Brazil under an actualistic look, I will present recently collected actualistic data that we have been using to assess taphonomical patterns of the aquatic insects of the Quadrant Formation. So let's begin. So during the early Cretaceous, Africa and South America were still united, forming Gondwana. However, these blocks were already beginning to detach, forming a narrow, shallow ocean. And on the edge of the ocean, there was an environment with diverse animal and plant life, which was preserved as this fossilifer unit that we know today as part of formation which is part of the so-called Aradipi Basin, whose rocks uh, are found here in Northeast Brazil. Also worth of saying that this limestone unit is regarding a conservat lavish chapter. But uh, what are the paleoenvironmental hypotheses for the crater formation? We have a large number of hypotheses that have been proposed regarding uh, the depositional environment of the unit, it has been hypothesized that it was a shallow, probably eutrophic freshwater lake or a saline lagoon with anoxic bottom waters, subject to very occasional freshwater incursions on surface water, or a stratified anoxic lake with saline upper water layers, or a complex or interconnected lake and rivers close to the sea, or a ether saline anoxic lagoon very deep, and even a mangrove. 
So basically, in very simplistic terms, we have authors either considering it as a single large lake or lagoon, depending on salinity, or complex of lakes and rivers of varying, uh, varying lands, and occasionally interconnected. And the depth is also contrasted, either as deep or shallow environment. And now let's already enter the, the taphonomy. Um, and in an interesting find, you can say for myself, horizons of mortality of mayflies larvae of the exogenic cheat family have been reported recently in the trap formation, suggesting already an autochthony of this mayfly group. Uh, so some taphonomical observations were already taken in the course of this previous study, in which we conclude that this group was autochthonous to the crater deposition of site. We also conclude that this larvae could have died to the increase in salinity due to the decrease in water surface. And since extant mayfly species generally do not tolerate high concentrations of salt, the increase in salinity to upper freshwater layers where they probably were living uh, caused this uh, exotic mass mortality. And the aquatic forms are the most promising for paleoenvironmental reconstructions because they are more prone to be autochthonous. But how to identify autochthony? And in this case, it's crucial to interpret um, the taphonomical signature. Uh, the degree of transport of fossils will imply the recognition of either autochthonous or alloctonous assemblages. And the disarticulation and transport are two close related parameters since disarticulation of them occurs during the transportation. However, uh, the high degrees of intacted joints and of conservation, in general, it's not a direct indicator of the absence of transport, since we observe several well-articulated fossils of the class of formation that were obviously alloctin. So in other words, we need to find uh, a group in abundance and with a record of several ontogenetic Basis to be um, way more of a strong indication of autochthony. While the disarticulation is, of course, very important, but must be associated with this later factor to confirm the autochthony. And it's possible um, to what I'm trying to make here, which is test of how easily a taxonomic group might disarticulate to compare with the fossil records. This is very informative because depending on the animal morphology, the degree of transportation this animal can endure before disarticulate can be very variable and even among phylogenetically closed groups. And finally, I think one of the most important things, it's paramount to carry out controlled excavation since isolated records may be biased. And luckily, I am working with data from the first ever made control excavation of the crop of formation, which is led by the laboratory of the regional university uh, here in Cariri, in Northeast Brazil. Now, regarding a little bit more of the aquatic impact. So in crop, we have the most well-represented Aquatic insects being the Femeroptera order, which are vulgarly known as mayflies, and the Iodonata order, which are vulgarly known as dragonflies and damselflies. And for those not familiar with the term aquatic insects, they consider it uh, insects because their juveniles are fully aquatic, as you can see here, and uh, juvenile dragonfly and the juvenile mayfly. Okay, so now it's also important to understand the gap in the study of these aquatic insects. Well, most studies with fossil of Ameroptera and Odonata of the crustaceans formation so far focus only on taxonomy. 
with only a few investigations having analyzed the general insect taphonomy of grasso and yet not using actualistic data so far. Then, since now already some of the goals, uh, since the exogenity is the most common family of arthropod found in the crater formation. And because their larvae are morphologically similar to those of the extant mayfly family, Batsidae, we analyze holistic data from the extant species Calibetus capixaba to assess taphonomical patterns of the exogen teeth. Also, in order to compare the taphonomical results among other significant aquatic groups, we also assess the phenomenal patterns of the other nata from the crater formation by also examining the atollistic data from its extant larval individuals. And just a little bit of our, of our methodology. So to perform the experiment with extant larvae, I collected so far 253 Calipetis capixaba larvae and 236 Odonata larvae. And during the field work in the Atlantic Forest of the Spirit Santo, I measured salinity, pH, and temperature conditions to establish the values for the control group. Then I took the insects to the lab to be raised in the aquarium. And everything happened in the course of a little bit more six months into three replicates. And a little bit more about uh, the experiment. So one aquarium was assigned to the control group and four aquariums were assigned for experimentation. Two for salinity tests and two for temperature tests. And after the death or molting of the larvae, so they either die or are able to survive and become the adult. And after that, we quantified the, them in relation to ontogeny and survival rate. In addition to also taking note of usual post-mortem position, which is the position that they get naturally after die. Uh, so also after the death of the insect, we perform this articulation test by carefully leaving the specimens to decompose on the different time slots into azolitic petri dishes. Uh, and finally, some odonatum specimens were also selected for immersion in salt water with different concentrations uh, of salt, of course, to assess carcass flotation. Now I want to show you some of our preliminary results of this experiment, starting with the mayflies. So these are the larvae, and I observed that the usual uh, postmortem positions of the larvae were eaten dorsal or ventral decubitus. And those arranged uh, in lateral decubitus, lateral decubitus is not the right term, but okay. Uh, these ones were, were being observed as, as being disturbed by the activity of other larvae and or minor current in the aquarium. So the natural position of that will be always either dorsal or ventral decubitus. And the specimens that died under high temperatures of 30 Celsius degree, they displayed their bodies without any natural curvature and presented this reddish coloration probably due to the acceleration of uh, cuticle denaturation that usually takes place at usually you know uh, every time takes place at high temperature. Now the specimens that were allocated in brackish water they died very quickly. In average, one day after allocation in the aquarium, while at least a few larvae allocated at lower salinity levels were able to survive. But in those lower salinity level, levels, oddly, the larvae were defecating in unusual amounts long before that, and this is not, not normal. 
So probably these larvae were releasing a lot of salt directly from the vacation since in fact, this pituitary system is linked to the digestive system via the motivian tube. But unfortunately, we have not seen anything that can be related to this process preserved in the fossil record. However, this does not in any way to the possibility that the larvae of the crato were living in conditions since the digestive tract and the feces are extremely delicate structures and without any hard parts and possibly not able at all to be preserved. And also, if they were living like that, the larvae were probably adapted to this. Continuing here now regarding the adult mayfly. So uh, I noticed that the adults that emerge and drowned afterwards. So they emerged and fell into the water and were drowning. They had their wings open and spread out. While those who died before falling to the water, like attached to, to the net, they had the wings abducted, like that. We also observed that without any water disturbance, the carcass did not sink to the bottom of the aquarium and the insect go through the composition without ever sinking. So the soft tissue of the abdomen um, will begin to decay immediately after that, and the fermentation of the abdomen further facilitates the boron phase. So I can say that the current experiments have showed that the small insects, which die in severe aerial conditions, they possess the very possibility, uh, uh, very few possibilities, sorry, to overcoming the surface tension and sink unless some disturbance causes that. And of course, this is not the case of organisms with high specific weights that when falling into the water can easily overcome the surface tension and descend to the bottom. So, after all that, what happens if we already have indication of a common uh, depositional site for the crater formation? Then we need to think of some other phenomenon that permits the sinking of the carcass. And the explanation in this case is maybe found in the formation of floating microbial mass, which when found on the surface of the water may lump together into this specimen and make them heavier, which breaks the water tension, and then uh, they will descend, as we can see here in this image of an atom during our experiment. Now, going back to the larvae, but regarding the desarticulation observation, um, the darkening and detachment of the digestive tract was one of the first processes that occur during larval decomposition. And this was less than a day after that. And possibly this influenced the disarticulation of other corporal elements, such as the tarot. And tarot was the most likely element to naturally disarticulate first, in average, um, three days after their death. Or it's worth of saying also that the disarticulation of thorax occurred way more fast in warmer waters that in most cases it disarticulated just one day after that. And most of the exogenic teeth of crato are complete and less than 3% of the specimens have disarticulated thorax, suggesting that the drifting period uh, before setting in the resting place was within less than a week, perhaps on less than a few days, highly suggesting autoctony. And as the exogen teeth larva from the crab formation rarely will present the disarticulated thorax, this indicates that their carcasses suffered little or no disturbance and that the decomposition process must also have been very slow. And now, finally, uh, I will present some of the results for the dragonfly. First, 
during the test immersion in saline water, we found that um, under hypersaline conditions, all the odonata carcasses immediately floated. And at lower salinity, uh, they sank to the bottom of the glass when submerged. And these carcasses only came to float um, two days after immersion at 35 parts per million of salt and three days after immersion at 0.5 parts per million of salt. And sure, this late buoyancy was probably due to the, the composition gases and not physical uh, characteristics of the water itself. So we can therefore say that the salinity levels must play a key role in increasing the buoyancy of the carcasses and thus their transport. Unless, of course, they are surrounded by microbial mass. For instance, um, another interesting thing is that also as affected carcasses from both Odonata and Ephemeropter, when immersed in saline conditions, had very slow the composition and desarticulation processes. And now regarding the desarticulation observations of the Odonata, the most sensitive element to disarticulate in the larvae was the labial mask, which is um, its mouth part. And it's this strange and unique structure that they use for hunting. But when I was pressed, the labial mask stays folded under the head and not like that, as you can see here, distended. So we consider it the labium disarticulated when it was Distended in such a way that it was possible to observe its tip in dorsal view up here in this image and all the others, but this is dorsal. So, besides the labium, also the legs uh, are also easily uh, disarticulated and especially under mechanical disturbance. Now, what we can say about the fossil? So, since we rarely found a labial mask preserved as desarticulated in the fossils. One hypothesis is that this structure desarticulates so early that is the first part of the body to completely detach uh, and it's not even preserved. However, we can see the labial in several specimens that uh, are preserved in ventral view and um, the labial there to attach but not as articulated. And also in our experiment, the labium never ever won't detach it from the body, as in the case of legs, for example, they are very easily detached. For that, um, our preliminary results show that although the odonata larvae were already pointed as a lock tunnel to the crater formation, they probably lived at least close to it and were not transported for long distances as evidenced by the completeness of their fossils. Now, another interesting thing is the natural death position of the dragonfly, such as, this, as in this image here, in this study. Uh, so when dragonflies die, either in dorsal or ventral deposits, it is more frequent for them to die in ventral sometimes dorsal as well. So when they die, they see in this characteristic position with the hind leg uh, descended and the fur leg and kind of in rest. However, the moment um, any disturbance happens, the distended hind leg is articulate because they are more exposed. So as soon as any disturbance such, such as caused by transport cells in, this position chain. And so far, we recovered several dragonfly larvae from Kratos displaying this natural position. And with the delicate hind leg, we still preserve. Okay, so now the final considerations. I think there are um, not a lot, but some. And after all these observations, we have some preliminary conclusions. First of all, are the exogenic teeth autochthonous 
are alloctonous? And the answer is most certainly alloctonous. Um, because here we have the most abundant invertebrates of Prato, presenting ontogenetic series and even already reported in mass mortality events. Now, uh, only 3% of exogenic sheep larvae were recovered, and these are data from the last control escalation, and only 3% were recovered with disarticulated thorax, which also agrees with autochthon. And now to the same question, but for the dragon size. First, it's important to know that we are considering here the Donata group in which we have larval representatives for the crater formation, which are the Proterogonfidis and Notomacrolidis, all in Isopter. So no Isopter larvae in crater so far. And uh, an Isopter are probably known as dragonfly and the uh, Isopter uh, dentalfly. Anyway, and those groups, Proterogonfidi and Notomacrolidis, were the only ones that actually lived in aquatic systems at least somehow connected to the depositional site. But the question is, how close they lived? And then after our preliminary study, we regard them for, um, as paratoctons, which is they went through limited transport to the depositional site. And this is mainly because although they are well articulated, these larvae lack ontogenetic sequences and clear abundances that we observe for the exogenic larvae, for instance. Also, the parautoctony is regarded instead of alloctony, given the, uh, the absence of, level of the labial mass preserved as disarticulated, being a strong indication of very short transport uh, suffer it. Also, several fossils analyzed showed a natural position of depth, including the all segments of leg preserves, being an extremely delicate element with minimal current or mechanical friction already disarticulating the hind legs, which is also in accordance with autochthony and or autochthony. And finally, this is a nice question. What can we hypothesize regarding the polar environment of the crater formation based only on the comparison uh, between its aquatic insect fossils and these atualistic data? So first, if salinity influences buoyancy, then at least the surface water of the system the crater formation depositional site were lacustrine, with microbial mats helping to sink the specimen. And the exception of preservation um, was probably mediated by this same microbial mat entanglement, even because, um, according to the biology of these autochthonous animals, we parsimoniously assume that they like today were not tolerant to falling in brackish photos. So briefly, we can corroborate the hypothesis that the pale environment of Crato was composed of a lake complex with no marine origin, basically a wetland with interconnected water bodies. So complete lack of trinlotic environments were very close to this kind of shallow depositional environment. Um, with some seasonal saline influence. And the saline influence, we can say because um, this is the fact due to the abundant presence of juvenile gas tube fish that probably used, used the depositional environment as a nursery in times of flood. And on the top of that, there were the microbial mats in the surface are similarly and recently hypothesized by Ribeiro and collaborators in 2021. So we conclude with experimental evidence that at least for the study aquatic larvae, the exceptional preservation per se, the articulation of many fossil uh, groups 
in the grapple would not have been possible if the carcasses had um, had been transported from outside the deposition side. And I think that's, that's it for now. We are still um, analyzing the best economic data from fossils, mostly from the dragonflies. So it's still a work ongoing, but for now, that is what I can say. And I hope you enjoy. I think I talk very, um, very fast as usual. Now I want to thank you very much for everybody that listened. Especially thanks for the Paula First Committee, also for all the institutions that I'm involved with, either funding or by collaboration. And I'm even now in the IIP region here in the state of Sierra and today specifically at the Paleontology Museum in Santana do Cariri. So, obrigada. Now, I, I hope I can answer the questions, if any will send, of course. Thanks so much for such a great talk. It was really cool to see all of your, all of your fossil insects and um, to understand more about where they used to live. Um, so just a reminder to the audience, um, you can send in your questions via the chat to the questions at Paleo Perks host um, directly. Um, so we have a few questions in already and I'll read them out and pop them in the chat for you. Um, so the first question um, is from uh, Kay Sender Sarwan. Um, so in the preliminary results, how did you account for scavenging by vertebrates and other scavengers as scavenging plays an important role in the articulation of a specimen? Um, are the scavenging rates negligible, which seems plausible via the deep water hypoxic paleoenvironment hypotheses? So, uh, I uh, in the crater formation, we have no indication of uh, this type of benthic fauna that usually uh, disarticulate the fossils, such as um, decapods, uh, crustaceans, uh, um, conscious trachons. Uh, so basically, benthic fauna are absent in the crater formation, and the fish that were living. Um, in the crater depositional site were only the dust field and they were so small, uh, although the, the, their, their length can be like to size, but the ones that use the, the crater depositional site, they were only the baby ones. So we do not expect that the fish were like disturbing the bottom. Great. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, so we have a, another question uh, from Sandra M. Skachat. So thank you for a wonderful talk. Uh, one, do you think uh, changes in salinity might be responsible for the mass mortality events and preservation of the insects? And two, do you have data on dis disarticulation of terrestrial insects in Crato? Okay, so first question. Uh, yes, we think that uh, salinity may have affect this, this mass mortal may have caused sorry this mass mortality event that we 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 reported recently because besides the fossils uh, on the the plane that we found the mortality event also crystals of halite which is a mineral that forms due to the precipitation of salt, they were also found in like in abundance. So we think that those larvae might have died specifically in this layer due to increasing salinity to the upper fresh waters. And second question. Okay, do you have? No, I don't have. I'm still only working with aquatic insects, but who knows, maybe in the future. Nice. Um, so we have another question. 
uh, from Rodrigo Ventura Germano. Uh, did you also, did you analyze um, adult um, Odonata or only the larvae? No, we didn't analyze, so no experiments were performed with the adult Odonata for that. This is only because they are, uh, their life cycle is so long that none of our larvae ever like molted into adults. So their original plan was to also analyze the adults, but this doesn't happen in, lab, uh, in the lab for that at this point. The only thing I can mention are the differences among some apparent abundance of adults in contrast to the larvae, like the fossils. So we have much more adults that are described in the literature. And of course, this might be biased to, due to their somehow of beauty appeal. But however, this also demonstrates um, a greater diversity among the adults that could reach the depositional site by slide, unlike the larvae that needed to be living closer to this water setting to be carried out. Um, that's why we can affirm so far from all the different groups recovered from the crato um, that the only ones that did actually live, while juveniles in the water setting connected to the crato were the protodobosity and not the macronic. I think I even talk a little bit more to the question. Great, thanks so much. Um, so, are there any species from your study which are around today, or are they all fossil species? Only extinct, so none. Actually, not even the like the, the families or the super families, nothing are uh, modern. We have only some phylogenetically close groups. Um, extant, but not these. Um, are there any other fossils in these deposits that might help you further reconstruct the paleo environment? We, yes, of course, the fish are very helpful because at least the um, juvenile ones were living in the in the crato, the positional side, and also they are very abundant. So it's very um, they are very informative for taphonomical work. So let me write the genus here. That's still. But regarding arthropods, I think the, the vast forms are exogenic change. The main slide in general. Yes. Um, so we have another question. Um, so, what biomineral are the fossils in your work made from? This way to appear here, so I can read as well. Yeah. Sure. Uh, Oh, okay. They usually they are preserved either as replacement of pyrite, I don't know, pirita, or um, they are uh, also carbonate, so due to carogenation. So these are the most common ones. And we also find some imprints sometimes. I hope I answered. Yeah. That was great. Um, um, so we don't have any more questions through. I'll just give everyone a few more seconds to send in some questions. Um, one more question. 
which species in your study is your favorite? Oh, the fossil ones or the extant ones? Uh, any of I, I can say both. I can say both. I'm very prone to love the mayflies and of course the exogenic teeth because I've been working with them since since my start on the paleontology. So um, very attached to them and the species will be properly the Neurialimai. They are like, oh, let me write here. They are like the, the little princess of the crop of Palo Lake. <laughs> they are everywhere. Oh, it must be so exciting to, to see all of these in your samples. Um, um, oh, okay, we have two more through. Uh, so the first one. Uh, uh, is uh, so do you have any data on the post embryonic molts as mayflies undergo ecdysis as they are also more numerous than other insect orders? I don't have the data, honestly, and this is a very good idea, actually. I'm going to write it down. I'm so sorry that I couldn't reply. Oh no, it's fine. Future work is, is always the most exciting part. Um, and we have one more three. Uh, can you speak a bit more about the different terrestrial insect faunas seen in the different crato beds? Yes, of course. So in the crato formation, if I understand right, because it still didn't appear here. So we have, a, oddly, different from other Cretaceous basins, um, we have a lot of terrestrial groups, and they are dominated by, by Orthoptera, and both Cainidae and Euconidae, and Emitera, and also Blataria. And after Ephemeropter, these are the most abundant um, groups, hexapoda groups in the crop formation. And it's very strange because also there we can't find some uh, key groups and they are uh, like coleoptera. We, we have a very scarce uh, record of coleoptera in the crop and nobody knows how to, to explain that because they are so um, abundant in other Cretaceous uh, deposits like Isa in Siberia. And also we don't have Plecoptera that usually are very associated. They are like um, given hands with Ephemeropera and Odonata in the Neotropics. And this is very strange. But uh, I think as soon as more people, more entomologists, start to dig in the crop of formation, those gaps might be filled or not, or it's just a taphonomical um, gap and data, taphonomical filter. So I'll give everyone just a few more seconds to send in any last questions. Um, Okay, no, no more through. Um, thank you so much again for your talk, Ariane. It was really, really cool. Um, and I'll now take back the screen share from you uh, to do a quick close out. Okay. Uh, so thank you everybody um, again for joining us and thank you so much to Ariane for um, such a great talk. Um, it was really exciting to see all of your data. Um, so please remember to fill out the weekly feedback form. Uh, the link will be in the chat so that we can learn a bit more about who attended today's seminar. And remember to join us next week um, on April 19th at the same time 
to hear from Javier Luke from Harvard University in the US. And we'll be hearing all about fossil crabs in a talk entitled Getting Crabby with it on the origins and evolution of tree crabs. Um, so happy Tuesday, everybody. Um, and we will see you again next time. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Yeah.